Good morning, Chapel Rock. It is a great privilege to be here today, to celebrate Jesus, to worship together, to be with our new church family, and very excited to be here. And in very short order, I have learned a lot about you. I have. I've learned a lot of things, but also about you. So let's start with what I've learned. Uh, first, I learned that, um, you know, when you, you're starting a new job, energy management's important. It is. So I finished my last job last Friday where I spoke at commencement at Central Christian College of the Bible. The next day, got on a plane, uh, went to Texas, where I went to a conference with Casey. And uh, we, we left Texas on uh, Wednesday night, got home to Missouri really late. It was about midnight by the time we hit uh, the bed the next morning, got a truck, and we loaded it to move here. Friday morning, we drove here and praised Jesus for the Chapel Rock staff who were there at the Arbuckle and unloaded us in record time. It was like two hours. And all our possessions that were in uh, our car and our truck were suddenly in the apartment. And I'll let you know when we find everything. Uh, <laughs> One thing that's really good is Deb took care of making sure the kitchen was settled. She's like, they're going to need to eat. And it, that is wonderful. So we're in really good shape. But then on top of that, you all have just spoiled us with generosity even before you know us. And there were welcome gifts in the, uh, uh, this box that you all provided. And you have no idea how much of a God-ordained thing that was. Because remember, I, I talked about time management, and that means priorities, Yesterday was a really big day in our life because it was our anniversary. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, it's worth clapping about. I'm pretty happy about it. So. <laughs> but uh, some of you provided some gift cards that actually made it possible for us to go out to dinner and not worry about things at the apartment. Thank you so much. Your kindness is overwhelming. You, you have blessed us. So we, we've seen your hard work. We've seen your staff. We've seen your generous heart. We've been able to worship Jesus with you and see your passion for him. And it's, it's exciting. It's really exciting to be here. So that's about you. <clears throat> My parents raised me. I'm supposed to share something about me when I meet people for the first time. And I... I think this is really important because it, it's really kind of the heartbeat of my ministry and how I, I see what I do, but also the way I see life. And that is a favorite. Everybody's got a favorite. And if you're sitting next to your spouse or if they're somewhere else, your spouse is your favorite. That's, that's the cue, okay? The spouse is your favorite. But we also have other things that are favorites, like our favorite car, our favorite movie, our favorite flavor of ice cream. Mine is all of them, and I'm willing to accept donations. <laughs> but I'm quirky, and I have a favorite word. It's a biblical word. In fact, this is, in my understanding, probably the most powerful word in the English language. Actually, it's not just English. It started in Hebrew, and it trickled down. It's so powerful that this one word captures the entirety of theology, the message of God from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation. Any guesses? Okay, we went through this in the first service and they just, do, okay, he's supposed to talk about hope today. And so this is, it's related, but not quite give you another hint. The word that encapsulates the theology of the entirety of Scripture only appears in the book three times. Twice in the Old Testament in the same book, in back-to-back -back chapters, and once in the New. The word is Emmanuel. What's it mean? God with us. Okay, that is a proclamation, that is a prophecy, that is a promise, but it's also 
when I speak, whether it's in front of a classroom or in front of a body of believers or wherever, that's also a greeting. Because I need the reminder of God's presence. And I think we all do. So let's try this out. I'm going to say the word and you remind me what it means, okay? Emmanuel! That's good, that's good, all right. But, you know, some of us are slow learners, so let's make sure that everybody has a chance to nail this, okay? All right, Emmanuel! Yes, that's great, that's awesome. Now, there will be a test later. Uh, Whoever it was who said there was going to be a test uh, about the names, this is my test. I'm only using one name. So, (laughs) have mercy on me, please. Will you pray with me before we get started? Father God, I thank you so much for the privilege of being here at Chapel Rock. I thank you for how you and your great wisdom mercifully brought us together, and we have the privilege of serving you and worshiping you this morning. Lord, be pleased with with our worship. Be pleased with our reverence for you. And know that we crave your presence in our life. Be present here in this moment and do not let us leave here without changing our hearts to be more like you. Father God, as we open to Romans 5, may Paul's words be your words into our life and may they guide us moving forward. In Jesus' name, amen. It is a great privilege to be here. And uh, I mentioned it in the prayer, we're going to be in Romans 5, so if you want to put your finger in your Bible or pull up your Bible app, this is a good opportunity to do that. Casey told me that you all are, uh, have already started a sermon series called Virtuous Reality. And last week uh, was about love. This week I've been asked to talk about hope. Um, I'll tell you, I think this is a great idea for a series because God, these virtues, these are aspects of who he is that he plants in us and shapes our character. But I want to draw attention to something that makes me a little worried when I heard that somebody may have written a significant portion of their sermon from last week using chat GPT. I'm a professor, uh, at least have been for the last several years, and, you know, plagiarism's a concern. I just, no, I'm just kidding. I love Casey, and I, I loved what he did with that. I just want you to know I didn't do any of that. I'm not smart enough. I couldn't have figured it out. And truthfully, this concept of hope is one that we desperately need, and no machine can articulate it for us. There's no possibility that some artificial intelligence could help us understand humanity's desperation for true hope. If you've been living in this world for the last few years, shoot, the last decade, we've seen a lot of examples of a lacking in hope. COVID flipped everything we knew on its head. It changed the way we relate to one another. I mean, I I recognize as I look out, and there's no judgment in me saying this, we still, some of us are not yet comfortable to come back together. And so there's this need for a hope beyond the, the struggles of today. And we've faced political upheaval and financial ruin. And there have been all kinds of difficulties that our nation has faced. Not to mention what's going on on the other side of the pond. There's a huge war being faced. And won't the day be wonderful when we wake up and we don't hear about just how many people died in a battle for land? Of course, we've got our own battles, gun violence and such going on here. It can be very difficult to have hope. It can be. And those aren't even the things that really rock our world. It's the personal stuff, the stuff that gets into us in our daily lives. The loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, the the struggle of facing a, a, a very unhappy boss, 
how are we going to pay the bills this month? Where, where did our security go? Our world is full of problems that become very personal. And whether it's something in your marriage or in your family or in your workplace or something, there is struggle and there is difficulty. And those things very quickly start to creep up on us. And we can lose sight of our hope. But it's my hope today that we can remember the presence of God. That Emmanuel, God with us, I told you there'd be a test, that's not the last one, come on. That God is with us and where he is present there is hope. And that's really what Paul is getting at in Romans. This, this letter that he wrote, it's actually a written sermon that was shared with the church and it was a church in crisis. The, the Roman church was in crisis because Emperor Claudius had kicked out all the Jews from Rome. That meant that half the church had to leave because half the church, maybe more, were Jewish Christians. And who was left? The Gentile, the non-Jewish believers. And they're the ones who have to figure out how do we do this Christian thing? Its origins are in the, the prophecies and practices of the Old Testament. And the people who knew it best, they had to leave. Now, what happened is they changed some of their methodologies, the way they did things. They did not change what they believed at all. But when they came back, because Emperor Claudius died. The next emperor, who his name is notorious, and we think really bad things, it was Nero. Uh, he lets them come back in. And when the Jewish believers come back in, they're coming back to a church that is practicing their faith different ways, a lot less Jewish. Wait a second, who brought the bacon? Why do we have bacon? Can you imagine? I'm just saying, there's a lot of change. And Paul writes this letter, and the, the first several chapters are all about, hey, you're not that different. You're all broken sinners who are in desperate need of a Savior to wash away your sin, and his name is Jesus. Then he comes to chapter 5, and that brings us to our passage today. Therefore, after we've covered all that stuff that I summed up way too shortly... Go read the book of Romans, it's great. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, since we have been made right with God through our faith in Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our, yeah, it's there too. Is it in your Bibles? Yeah, okay. Sufferings. This seems really out of place. I don't like the suffering part. That's the part I don't like. Did anybody just really enjoy that? You're not, no, okay. Your head was going here and then finally, no, no, okay. That's good. Not alone. But here's the thing. Paul's not the only one who identifies this. If we flip over to 1 Peter, in the first chapter, he tells us we should be joyful when we struggle, when we have suffering, because it purifies our faith. Jesus' brother, James, wrote a book. And that book, he doesn't even get three verses in. And he says, you know, you need to take joy in your suffering, in your trials, in your difficulty, in your trouble. But Paul lays out for us very succinctly here why. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering. Just so we understand, that word glory, we can get confused. Here Paul's not talking about the glory of God. He's talking about how our sufferings can, we can glorify them. But he's saying we can talk about them. We can take pride in them. We can rejoice in them. We can be glad because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame 
because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You know, I say, well, when did, when did that happen? When did we get, well, if you are an immersed believer, that happened when you were baptized into Christ. Acts 2.38 says that the, the people, they all repented of their sin. They confessed Christ as Lord and they were immersed. They were baptized into Christ and received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You, you have the presence of God in you. Emmanuel! That's right. That's right. God is with you. And we grow through that times of struggle and, and, and trouble and tension and difficulty and we rise, through our, we rise to the challenge through perseverance. Perseverance, walking with Jesus, walking with his spirit. And in the meantime, he shapes our character, which develops hope in us. This is very true in Paul's life. Paul, he wasn't a Christian. He was a Jewish leader. He was trained by Gamaliel, one of the seven great rabbis of the Jewish faith. Uh, that would be like going to Harvard or something, you know, because the Old Testament is called the law. Yeah, he was a, a law student. But he didn't like this whole Jesus thing. He thought it was going to ruin Judaism. And so he was stamping it out until one day he was on his way to Damascus and Jesus put his foot down, literally. Showed up and said, why are you persecuting me? By the way, Jesus had already died and risen again. And so Paul was pretty acquainted with the idea that if Jesus was actually alive, that meant his whole philosophy and theology was wrong. And he spent the next three days sorting that out and prayer and fasting, was baptized, and then became a great advocate of Jesus and the way. Yeah, I saw that sermon series too. But then he faced lots of trouble. Because his own friends and maybe members of his family sought to ruin him. Because they didn't like what he was preaching. Because he was saying they were wrong. That they still needed Jesus. He would wind up facing shipwreck, illness, beatings, left for dead, thrown into prison multiple times, ultimately martyred for his faith. But in all that trouble, he learned to persevere, leaning on Jesus. Jesus shaped his character to be like him. So that when we read Paul's letters, Jesus seeps through the pages for us. And that gives hope. And Paul's hope is that the church in Rome could be unified. And that the way of Jesus could grow all throughout the world. But he wasn't alone. This wasn't a new thing. It wasn't even a New Testament thing. Did you get one of these when you came in? Yeah. If you didn't get one of these, this is a rock. That's not rock candy. Please do not chew on this. That will hurt. Be, the, the dental bill will be very hurtful. Uh, but they're important. They are also not weapons. Okay. Well, not in the traditional sense. They do have a weapon quality, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But this is really important. So hang on to that. See, there's a number of times where we see this, this series of events, the trouble, the perseverance, the character, the hope, happen in Scripture. It's not just Paul. And I want to bring a few of them to light. And the first one has to do with a rock, actually 12 rocks, 12 stones. It takes place in the book of Joshua, but in order to understand the significance of the 12 stones, we got to go back all the way to the book of Exodus. There's a story about another man named Moses who God raised up to free his people, the Israelites who were enslaved. They had been slaves for 400 years, four centuries. Think about how many generations were born a slave, lived a slave, and died a slave. But the nation of Israel under enslavement, just continued to grow. Well, you know, God did say be fruitful and multiply, and they took it seriously. So, and after 400 years, Moses led them out of slavery. They 
passed through the Red Sea where God parted it and they were journeying on to the promised land. Along the way, they stopped at Mount Sinai. They worshiped God there. God gave them the law. And when they finally arrived at the Jordan River, which was the border into the promised land where God had set apart, they actually got scared. They got scared Because they heard reports that there were giants over there. That the people in the land of Canaan, the promised land, were bigger than they were and stronger than they were. And they they wouldn't just hand over their land. They were scared they would fail. God's response to their lack of faith, their lack of remembering his presence with them, was he said, okay, for the next 40 years you're going to wander around in the desert until this generation dies off. Only two people in their immediate families were able to cross who were there that day. They were actually the two spies of the 12 who said, no, no, we got to go take the land now. They come back 40 years later and they're ready to go. That was Joshua and Caleb. Joshua was uh, was God's hand-picked successor for Moses. He had been mentored by Moses for quite a while. 40 years. Then God says, hey, Moses is dead. I'm sorry. But good news, you're now in charge. The one thing he failed at, get the people across the river, take over the promised land, yeah, that's your marching orders. Congratulations. And I imagine there may have been some fear and trepidation in Joshua. But then Joshua 1.9 says, God himself said, ah, But be strong and very courageous, for I am with you. That's right. You know this verse. I like that. Come on. Yeah, I see you. Yeah. It's it's okay. We, We need to be loud in church, especially when we're quoting scripture. That's awesome. You know what that verse is saying? It's saying, Emmanuel. That's right. You're being loud too. That's good. Keep it up. Then they go and they cross the Jordan River. God gives Joshua the plan of what he's going to do and he like stops the Jordan River puts his hand down he didn't have to part it he just stopped the inflow and that happened when the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the water just stopped it and then they walked to the middle and they held the Ark of the Covenant where a couple million people go into the promised land But God also gave Joshua some other instructions that in our next passage, he passes along to the leaders of Israel. Joshua 4 says this. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe. And he said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, in the middle of the Jordan. And each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. See, God wanted them to remember their struggles, their trouble. And he wanted them to remember how this group persevered. And that over those 40 years, their character was shaped to be more like God as he taught them through the law. And that developed a hope of God's presence. And he never wanted them to forget the hope of God's presence. And so they made this memorial to help them remember. God always wants his people to remember his presence. His presence in your life. In his presence, there is hope. Emmanuel. Now I want to talk about one stone with a really weird name. And it's not just something we see in Christmas stories. It started here. In this story. You see, the people of Israel, they, they did well taking over the promised land, but in the centuries to come, their faith would waver. And they would lose sight of the presence of God in their life, and they would worship other gods, and they would 
oftentimes lose sight of the fact that in God's presence there is hope. But then they would repent and they would come back to him. During the time of 1 Samuel, we see the, God raise up a leader like none that had come before him. He was a, a prophet, he was a priest, and he was literally a kingmaker. He anointed two different kings of Israel. His name was Samuel. And in this scene, the people of, of God, the Israelites, have been bullied terribly by the Philistines. But suddenly the people start turning back to God. And they start crying out to him. And so Samuel starts leading them in the steps of repentance and true worship of the living God. And he calls them to start putting their, putting their life in, into what they were saying. Let's live this. To help them remember God's presence in their life. 1 Samuel 7, 12 says this. Samuel took a stone and he set it up between Mizpah and Shin, these two towns in Israel. And he named it Ebenezer, saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. Now while they continued to worship God there, the Philistines were creeping in. And God went out ahead of them. And he just put them in this terrible panic. They actually started fighting against themselves. And so by the time the Israelites knew about it, their fighting men just went up and just wiped the floor with all of them. God delivered them into their hands. Why? Because he helped them remember their trouble and the struggles that they had. And they persevered and they, they turned back to God and they, they said, God, give us your character. Shape our character to be more like you. And that gave them a hope of what is to come because they reflected on the past and what God was doing. And so they had a much brighter future. That is God's plan for you. He wants his people to remember his presence. And in his presence, there is hope. Emmanuel. Okay. This next set of stones, the rolling stones. Not those stones. Different stones. We'll talk about them one at a time. The first one happens in... The first one happens in the book of John... It's about a week and a half, two weeks before Jesus is crucified and rises from the dead. He gets a message from his dear friend, Mary and Martha, that his other dear friend, their brother, Lazarus, was very ill. And they're asking him, come quickly. We know you can heal him. See, they had hope in Jesus. And then Jesus did the exact opposite. He had some things on his agenda that he wanted to do. He did not go there, not right away. And then eventually he does. And when he arrives, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Mary and Martha come out to him immediately. Well, if you could only have been here. Maybe you're in that moment in your life where you're just like, God, if you just would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. My spouse and I wouldn't have had that fight. I wouldn't have lost my job. This other thing wouldn't have happened if you just could have been here. And Jesus says, oh, don't worry. I'm the resurrection and the life. If you believe, you're going to see the glory of God. And so he goes to the grave of his dear friend, Lazarus. And he weeps there with him. Shortest verse in the Bible, it says, Jesus wept. He acknowledges the feeling of hopelessness that they all felt. I think Jesus wept because he knew what he was about to do and he was... Sad that his friend was going to have to experience death twice. But then he insults the whole community. He does. He says, roll away the stone. And you say, how does that insult the whole community? Well, this was long before Israel had embalming practices. So there's going to be a terrible stench. In fact, Martha said, there's going to be a terrible stench. He says, don't worry about it. I got this. He says, take away the stone in John 11, 38 and 39. 
Just realized I skipped a slide, sorry guys. In doing so, he invited them to do what they could do. And they rolled away the stone just hoping that it was there. Take away the stone, he said. And all their trouble and all their difficulty, they're struggling, hoping they can persevere, but they do. They lean in and they move the stone. And then Jesus gets real specific. Thank goodness it was a little early to say this. He says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes hopping out. Just think if he didn't say Lazarus' name. That day's coming. That day's coming. Lazarus comes out and they take the, gr gr the, the grave clothes off of him. They, they saw the trouble, the loss of their friend. But they persevered, they leaned in just wanting Jesus to be there, not knowing what he was going to do. And he showed up and he takes care of it. It builds their character and they now have an even greater hope. This hope that they desperately need. See, God wants his people, especially those who are hurting and heartbroken and in pain, to remember all the times that he's already been there. And if that's you today, to hear this, God is present with you, and where he is present, there is hope. Emmanuel. And I'm sure you've had times where you've seen that in your own life. But maybe sometimes it's really hard to, to experience that for yourself. I'm telling you, that's why I spend so much time focused on the presence of God. Because I need the reminder. And we all do. See, they couldn't raise Jesus from the dead themselves. But they could do something. So they did what they could do. We see the same thing happen just a couple weeks later. Jesus dies on the cross. Buddy, bloody, beaten, bruised. His body torn to shreds. It's taken down lifeless. Joseph of Arimathea donates his own tomb that had never been used, and they lay Jesus there. And the women who witnessed Jesus' death, they, they take note of the stone being rolled in front of the tomb and where it is. I want you to just consider how hopeless they must have felt, how much trouble and struggle and difficulty they had going on. The hope of Israel in their understanding was that Jesus was going to raise up an army and overthrow Rome, and now he's dead. Will you join me in Mark 16? The words will be on the screen here. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, they bought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone? from the entrance of the tomb. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. They took their own money, they invested it in spices to prepare Jesus for burial. Jesus died right before the Sabbath began on Friday evening. They couldn't do any work. So they had to wait Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning. And now they come to anoint his body for burial after the fact. So decay, smell, all that stuff. They, that's what they're thinking they're going to face. They don't even know how they're going to get to his body. How are we going to get in? It takes many men to roll away such a stone. They would put that there for grave robbers and to keep away the stench of the decaying body. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. They didn't know how they could get the job done, but God was already planning to meet them. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. And he says, don't be alarmed. Every time an angel shows up, he's like, don't be scared, don't be afraid. You might have a complex. 
He says, you are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. The author of life will never be found in death. Never. He will only triumph over it. See the place where they laid him? Go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now let's pause there for a second because we have to make note of something. Okay. In our movement, we tend to talk about the first gospel sermon being Simon Peter in Acts 2. Proclaiming the gospel message. And he did. But the very first individual to do this, to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus, was an angel. And the second was a group of women. And they had a very specific responsibility. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter what race you are, your socioeconomic background. If you are in Christ, we are called to share the message of Jesus because that declares his presence. And in his presence, there is hope. But it starts with us recognizing that we have trouble. We have difficulties. We have struggles. We all have them. But the presence of Jesus is what causes us to persevere and to lean in and say, you've got me, and I believe that you've got me. And that gives me the ability to accept how you are changing my character, even when I don't want to change. You're shaping my character to be more like Jesus. And that gives me hope. Because if you did it back then, you're going to do it again. God's been in the business of rolling stones for over 2,000 years, and he's not about to quit. 1 Peter 1.3 tells us that we have a living hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is that not an awesome thing? God intends that each of us, each of our stories, each of the struggles, that we will embrace that. Not just put it aside and hide from it, but we will embrace it and allow the trouble to be the shaping tool that causes us to learn perseverance, that causes our character to be changed so that we can share the hope of Jesus with our own life, with our own families, with our church and beyond. Guys, I got to tell you, this is very real to me and I want and I hope that when you leave here, it'll be very real to you. Each of you got a rock when you came in. And if not, hopefully you'll get one and this seems to be going well. Nobody's thrown them. But those rocks are very important because they serve a purpose. This rock is one I picked up a few months ago. My wife and I knew that we weren't going to be at Central Christian College of the Bible much longer, but we didn't know where we were heading. We had con- you know, been in contact with other churches and ministries and had discussions. Some of them went really close and then suddenly they just disappeared. We're like, Lord, okay, what's the next step? We don't know. Out of the blue, I get a phone call from a good friend of mine. His name is Jim Estep. He happens to be a very good friend of Pastor Casey. And they have a conversation about this position. Jim says, you need to talk to Brandon. Well, Jim calls me and says, you're going to get a phone call from Casey Scott. I'm like, I don't know Casey Scott. He's like, no, but you're going to love him. And you need to listen to what he has to say. So, Okay. So we wind up having a Zoom call, and uh, it went so well. It was the first step in the interview process. A few days later, I went for a walk on an unseasonably warm day in Missouri. I think it was in early March. Could be wrong on that. But as I was walking along, I was praying. I do a lot of prayer walking. And I'm like, Lord, you kind of broke my heart on a few of these near misses. I, I want to hope here. And he says, don't worry, I got you. He didn't say it wasn't audible, but it was like this overwhelming sense of calm that just washed over me. And I felt his words, I've got you. This is very important that you go through this process. I said, okay, Lord, I'll believe you. And I looked down, I was standing in front of this really nice neighborhood and they had beautiful landscaping with this like red mulch not a rock in sight except right on top this one right here 
I picked it up as I've done on other occasions where I felt God was speaking to me. I picked it up and I put it in my pocket and I've held it there until today. Because God was reminding me of all he's done in my past and all the trouble that I've gone through. That he's teaching me perseverance and shaping my character so that I can better share the hope of Jesus. And then he brings Sherry and I to a church family committed to something that we are very committed to. The hope of Jesus. Jesus is in the process of making all things new. He says so in the book of Revelation. He's not just doing something over again. He's not about business as usual. He wants to do something new. That means we have to change. And ta- change takes some friction, some traction, some trouble to learn perseverance to develop our character to give us hope the apostle peter writes in first peter chapter 2 that we approach jesus the the cornerstone as living stones and we together the church are being formed up into the the living tabernacle, the the living temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's where his presence dwells. So if you're here today and you've got struggles and you've got troubles and difficulties that you have faced, I want to remind you you're not alone. This room is full of testimony of how God has been in the business of using that trouble to give us hope. And he's not about to stop. So that rock that you have... That black rock looks something like this. Take it home. For some of you, it's going to represent the struggle you're facing right now. And that's okay. But remember all the things God has brought you to to this point. For some of you, this might mean the struggle that you're facing right now, and you don't know the presence of God, but you're hearing this and you're saying, I want to do something about that. After we're done here, Casey's going to come up and and provide you an invitation. Take, Take him up on that. But take your rock with you because it'll be a reminder of this journey. For others of you, there are all kinds of other things that this might be a reminder of. Take this and be reminded of the hope we have in Jesus and his presence. If you've got nothing else, it could be a reminder of that one day the crazy preacher came and armed the audience because this is a weapon, but it's a weapon of hope. We have hope because of his presence. Emmanuel, and where he is, there is hope.